Hello everybody, my name is Maciej Kalaga and I'm here to speak about medieval martial ethic as a conceptual repository for the just war theory. And I have to start by um, justifying the choice of the subject as well as outlining my research question. So let us start by stating that how to tame humans' proclivity for violence has been a very old problem, probably even the original problem addressed by any kind of culture. Diverse kinds of philosophies, mythologies or simple taboos were introduced to protect life as a particularly a precious value and to frame killing as wrong. Those, however, had to be somehow reconciled with the actual social-cultural reality, which has never been free from lesser or greater scale violence. Hence, a need emerged for what is nowadays called in the West the just war theory, a concept named after and developed from its medieval predecessor known as bellum justum. In the literature on the history of international law and military theory, Bellum Justum has been considered mostly in its relation to the Crusades and medieval legal systems. Discourse around it uh, has revolved around questions pertaining to Christian ethics, religious dogmata and power structures within the Latin world, especially as elucidated by Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, as well as to the notion of the natural law, whose development happened largely due to the debates about the just wars. Its political entanglement has also been scrutinized, especially in the context of dynamics of Spanish conquest of the Americas and German eastward expansion in the Slavic and Baltic territories, as well as the increasingly sophisticated resistance strategies employed by these lands' native elites. In effect, just where theories, philosophical roots and frames, as well as politically charged and ethically questionable applications are well known. However, these observations refer to the macro scale, decisions taken by temporal or spiritual leaders and enacted at the community or strategic levels. At the same time, the question of these concepts relevance for and circulation at the grassroots level, namely choices made by individual combatants in violent encounters on and off the battlefield, has been left virtually unaddressed. The submission is all the more puzzling if we consider that much of medieval warfare consisted of confrontations between individuals rather than masses. Moreover, interpersonal violence was endemic throughout the Middle Ages and well into the early modern period, and had its own unwritten ethic combining Christian spirituality, um, pre-Christian martially flavored notions of honor and masculinity, and common sense. If these grassroots cultural encapsulations of bloodshed had remained entirely detached from their higher order renderings, it would be quite surprising. Small wonder then that scholars have already found traces of just war theory in medieval didactic literature directed at young knights, that is, future leaders and combatants. The question remains, however, whether this was only a top-bottom process, from learned jurists and theologians usually recruited from the clergy to lay poets and knights of the order of the Bellatores. What if we uh, hypothesize that the flow of ideas had an opposite, bottom-up vector? Was it indeed always the just war theory imposed on the everyday, uh, everyday martial praxis, or the other way around? Uh, with uh, experiences and conventions of interpersonal violence informing the theory. In order to address this question, I'll proceed in three steps reflected by the three major divisions of this presentation. First, I'll present the defining features of the late medieval just war theory as reconstructed in the existing literature. I am not going to trace the whole historical development of this concept rooted well in antiquity, as it would blow this section out of proportion. Next, to avoid vague generalizations and ground my observations in the actual statements made by medieval people, I'll focus on a particular period, the turn of the 14th and 15th centuries, particular place, southern Germany, and text, a martial arts manual from the Nuremberg manuscript, HS 3227A. Therefore, the second section will introduce the chosen manuscript and examine its content relevant to my research question. And finally, I propose conclusions based on my theory-driven reading of the source. As already mentioned, the historical notions of just war theory, that is, conceptualizations of circumstances in which it would be ethical to resort to violence or even kill other human beings, have already been considered in numerous studies. There is no place here to quote all the major works, much less the entire corpus of them. So instead I'll quote two important and relatively new contributions which not only engage and list the older literature but also provide fresh and useful perspectives on the subject. James Turner Johnson, in the latest edition of his classical work, argues that although the roots of the Western just theory can be traced to pre-Christian times, 
It wasn't given definite and sophisticated legal, ethical and theological framing until debated by Christian theologians, starting from Augustine through Gratian to Thomas Aquinas. He also carefully distinguishes between two major pillars of the just war theory, the right reasons to wage war, called jus ad bellum, and the right methods to wage war, called jus in bello. In its major form, jus ad bellum would usually include uh, the following criteria. Just cause, causa justa, meaning that the, meaning the ethically justified reasons to wage war, the right authority, auctoris principis, uh, stating that war has to be declared by an anointed ruler and not opposed by his people, right intention, intentio recta, uh, saying that war has to be waged with an honest will and determination to stick to its just cause, and with secondary uh, criteria of proportionality, that waging war has to bring less harm than restraining from violence, that violence has to be the last resort, uh, refer to only when other attempts at peacemaking fail, and that war has to be meant to achieve peace or restore previous peace. Uh, and as such, jus ad bellum contained purely ethical conditions, informed by their author's Christian faith and theological formation. On the other hand, jus in bello concentrated on more practical aspects of war, that is, discrimination, called also distinction, which said who and to what extent should uh, be excluded from wars, and again, a different kind of proportionality, this time um, defined by how to adjust the use of military means to a given situation in order to minimize harm. Unlike the moral criteria listed in jus ad bellum, those re required for a war to remain just once it started required good practical knowledge of warfare. Let us mark this observation as it will become significant later. In another work, Marek Tam offers a study of how the just war theory and the idea of the Crusades were reinterpreted and thwarted since the 12th century to uh, justify the expansion of the Teutonic Order, as well as German and Polish principalities, towards the northern and eastern pagan territories, such as those of the Polabian Slavs or Baltic Prussians. Tam notes that the ordinary crusades were easy to present as just, war, uh, as just wars. They clearly had a just defensive cause to defend the Holy Land from the pagans and the right intention in the reconquest, uh, glory of God and personal salvation were declared by anointed uh, authorities, Pope and Emperor, followed diplomatic attempts, failed mm, diplomatic attempts at persuading pagans to return Jerusalem so they were last resort, and were meant to ensure peaceful pilgrimage and worship for Christians, making them suitable for restoring peace, and therefore just. The so-called Baltic or Northern Crusades, on the other hand, offered a much greater challenge in that regard. The pagan lands had no Christian historical sites or relics to defend or reclaim, no Christian population to protect. Therefore, just reasons for invading and conquering these lands could come only from two situations a preemptive attack aimed at stopping future pagan raids into Christian territories uh, and as a means to protect peaceful missionaries trying to convert uh, pagans and new converts living in the pagan territory. It has to be granted to these crusades that of course they had the right authority, they met with that criteria, but much less the last resort and the restoring peace and these were largely debated already in the Middle Ages, as well as the whole stages of justness uh, in this case. Uh, Professor Tam went on to convincingly show that both ideas were skillfully juggled by late medieval political leaders in Italy and Germany to garner political support for military expeditions into the Slavic and Baltic lands. They were also met not only with military resistance by the pagans, but also a theoretical one offered by uh, Christian intellectuals, as exemplified by the vivid uh, polemics with the practice of framing Teutonic Order's expansion as a crusade and just war, which was offered in the 15th century by Polish academicians, most notably Stanisław of Skalbmierz or Paweł Wodkowicz of Brudzyn, who argued for the right of pagans to have their own states and lands independent from the authority of the papacy or the empire, as well as their own religious beliefs. However, 
as announced uh, at the beginning, I would like to pay some more attention to the grassroots level of this phenomenon because what we discussed before was at the high level, uh, that is the strategic or community level. So I would like to ask why was it so easy for ordinary German as well as Bohemian or Polish knights and men at arms to accept that the defensive war uh, could include a preemptive offensive and even conquest of the enemy's territory? Is greed for land and loot really a sufficient explanation? Leaving it this way would imply feeble significance of the metaphysical factors affecting fighting men's decision-making, such as the hope for achieving salvation for their pious lives and repentance from sins. This, in turn, would uh, question the whole body of research arguing for the contrary, based on evidence from other areas of medieval life. Uh, one could, of course, argue that knights, and especially the young or impoverished ones, were interested in the Northern Crusades because they offered an opportunity to win honor, called Ere or Tugend in medieval German, which uh, was a crucial asset in upward social mobility. However, this could be objected on the grounds that, as shown by Anne Kluster in her extensive review of periods modern judicial and administrative documents, that in order to upkeep or gain honor through combat, German men had to follow an unwritten martial ethic. And this ethic would include uh, the following principles. Seeking mediation uh, or other peaceful means to resolve uh, the conflict, fighting only in defense, warning before resorting to violence, ensuring equality in numbers and weapons, as well as proper fighting techniques such as not using thrust with the sword or by hitting only with the flat of the blade, especially when countrymen were involved in, fellow countrymen were involved in conflict, and uh, a ban on magic, charms or other supernatural support. All the above rules show significant overlap with the just war criteria, with the first three resembling some of the use ad bellum components, whereas the other three smoothly fitting the use in bello. Interestingly, these unwritten rules, solidified as tradition and actively practiced, were often at odds with official legal uh, regulations formulated under the influence of the leading moralists of the time, who were strongly opposed to the very idea of setting the record straight through combat. Even more importantly, though, as late as in the 16th century, a German noble or burgher who fought for honor against the law, but who followed all the rules of this unwritten martial ethic, could reliably count on leniency from the judges, who by definition were themselves men of honor. This observation would suggest that experiences of personal combat, conducted uh, or just spectated, may have influenced the reception of the jazz world theory outside the academic and clerical circles, or perhaps even informed the theory itself. In order to explore this hypothesis further, I decided to examine the conceptualization of martial arts, along with their praxis and axiology, preserved in one of the so-called Feitbooks, or Fechtbücher in German, that is, written manuals discussing such arts as sword fighting or wrestling. The Feitbook in question is a part of a larger codex, known under its inventory number HS3227A or under various other names such as the Nuremberg Codex or, mistakenly, Dobringer Codex. It's currently held in Nuremberg and probably originated somewhere in southern Germany. Its dating is disputed but can be reasonably approximated to around 1400 AD. There's no room here to provide a detailed overview of this source, but it is important to note that the martial arts teachings con uh, contained therein are quite unusual, since unlike other similar works from the period, they offer a wealth of remarks not only on the kinesthetic, but also philosophical, ethical and tactical strategic aspects of armed combat. Moreover, the said five book is considered the first of a larger corpus of similar writings, all of which are connected by the fact that they quote certain Master Lichtenauer, and his martial teachings as their source of lore and legitimacy. Finally, it is believed to be a work of a competent martial artist who at the same time have originated from or been influenced by the scholastic tradition. So it seems a perfect vantage point for tracing any potential crossover between pragmatic martial law and academic just war theory. In order to infer its conceptual structure, I used the qualitative content analysis method assisted with the Max Studio 8 uh, software for qualitative coding visualization. Apart from looking for text fragments corresponding to the elements of the just war theory identified in the previous literature, I investigated the entire work and coded other topics discussed in it as well. 
This way, I was able to track interrelations between martial practices and values as described in the source, even in these cases where such connection was not made explicit by the author. An interesting finding of this sort uh, was an apparent contradiction between the oft-expressed need for swiftness, bravery and proactivity in seeking the first strike, called Vorschlag, on the one hand, and the need for measure, self-control and consider uh, consideration in combat advocated by the author. However, as illustrated by the conceptual map here, consideration and self-control, called Klugheit, uh, give me a second, I point it, consideration here, uh, are seen by him as connected to measure, called Mose, which in turn is understood as a quality ensuring fencers proper choice of strength, speed or distance for a given combat situation. Measure in this text is also tightly connected to footwork, called Schreten or Treten, and through swiftness, uh, Richheit, and consideration here, to good spirit and bravery, called good Mut uh, and Kunheit. This way, although not explicitly, the author of the manuscript demonstrate, demonstrates how swift and audacious offensive fighting style, uh, termed Forschnack here, is rooted in careful consideration, measure and all these things, uh, such as foresight, cunning and well-managed footwork. A paradox well known also in modern combat sports literature. And this remark seems worth making because it so happens that the concept of measure, Morse, was also central to German didactic literature throughout the whole medieval period. Traditionally, this has been connected to the influence of Christian axiology and classical philosophical traditions and thus interpreted as a theme repeated in chivalric or martial texts after clerical moralists. However, if we consider that the importance of measure, understood as an ability to act deliberately and precisely, is also highlighted in modern, strictly pragmatic texts coming from a different culture, such as the quoted influential sport fencing manual by Zbigniew Tchaikovsky. It becomes necessary to ask whether it wasn't the other way around. Perhaps it was the martial law, informed by actual uh, experiences of interpersonal combat, that shaped the medieval didactic and moralist discourse. This idea may be corroborated if we notice that the author of the manuscript apparently understood that martial prowess alone does not guarantee success in combat. What's also needed is a certain amount of God's favor, or luck as we would nowadays call it. To quote, whatever one wishes to do against the other has to be well trained and performed as if he, he would say, this I mean to truly conduct. And so it shall and must go forward with the help of God, so it may fa fail him in nothing. End of quote. Without this determination and divine support, as the author observes, quote, it often happens that a peasant or an unlearned strikes a good master with, uh, with this, for he conducts the first strike and bravely rushes forward, end of quote. And winning God's favor uh, required one to fight a good fight, which brings us back to the just war theory. There are several fragments of the fight book which can be convincingly classified as matching some elements of just war, namely causa justa and intentio recta. The table here shows these fragments as well as others which warn against relying on defensiveness and thus illustrate the leading strategic idea of the book, that the only sure defense can be achieved by a preemptive attack. Uh, two things uh, seem interesting here if, if we look especially at the bolded fragments. First, the lack of any reference to the right authority, actoris principis. The same difference could be observed between uh, the just war theory and the unwritten martial ethic described by Professor Kluste. Uh, this would suggest that the teachings preserved in the Nuremberg Codex were closer to the actual grassroots martial practice of the day rather than to the academic theories of combat. Second, the emphasis on attacking as a means of defense remained a characteristic feature of German sword fighting traditions at least until the end of the 16th century and perhaps well, even well into the 19th century. It also brings us back to German knights eagerly accepting preemptive missionary expeditions against pagan Slavs, Prussians or Livonians as defensive just wars. In conclusion, the investigated fight book provides a window into late medieval conceptualizations of martial practices in their moral dimensions. By doing so, it reveals how this axiology was uh, rooted in down-to-earth pragmatic realities of combat, the centrality of measure, Mose, 
in the martial arts system of master Liszt and Auer does not have to be seen as a trope borrowed from period didactic literature, but may just as well be a practical principle distilled from actual violent experiences. Similarly, the same experiences may have served as an epistemic residue, which served as a foundation for development of the just war theory. This seems all the more probable uh, when we consider that, as a rule, medieval thinkers, philosophers, lawyers, and even clergymen were socialized into the culture of the sword and possessed at least basic practical martial formation. So much so that there are confirmed historical instances of fencing masters belonging to the medieval oratories, such as priests or monks. In that respect, clear continuity can be traced from antiquity, quoting Plato's wrestling background as a famous example, well into the modern period. However, obviously, due to the preliminary character of this study, further research or more research would be needed to substantiate this hypothesis further. Thank you very much for your attention.